Salutations, everyone, and welcome back to Hearts of Iron 4 with TNO. Of course, last season of Europe, which we're playing with a sub mod, Sony Plus, but 1942. It was the evening when they beached the boat, the boat on the shore, eastwards. The sun lingered in rosette and PQs, warming the clouds for a final time before descending beneath the mountains and under the curve of the earth. Lamb stood, waiting for the headman of the fishing boat to divide the dev day's catch. Here you go, the man said, thrusting dry, sh uh, rough dry sheaves of paper money into his hand along with some change before I forget. Your uncle wanted to see you this evening. Lamb gave a wry smile, thanking the headman. He turned to leave. The four intervening years end up in kind of China, Lamb summarized. In the village where brocades of silks had threaded their ways to markets worldwide, now the children flashed off hot waters, or fished off them. The waves susurrated uh, behind him as he lifted one foot behind the other into dry soil. A dirt path would through the wood, leading back to the village. Crooked stripped as the earth grew cold, sparse poles mounted with torches lit the way forward. Two houses down from his parents' home, the lamb knocked on the door of his uncle's abode. Come in, a voice said. A shout drowned a whisper. Candles lit the empty floor space where there had been looms and other tailoring equipment. The soldiers took all of it and more. The looms, the needles, the mulberry seeds, everything now. Even the wooden boards had gone into disrepair, rotting and falling into the grassy void beneath the elevated house. At the end of the work halls of his uncle's room, who was sitting in a chair beside the bed, bandages wrapped themselves around where his foot was shut four years ago. Good, you're here, his uncle said, coughing. I need you to take the, this packet of tea to your mother. He handed Lamb a square shaped package with cryptic characters on the front. Good for your digestion, he glanced at his foot. I'm no good now, I can't even walk to deliver this. Everyone has a bad day, Uncle, Uncle Lamb said. Not your fault. Lamb stood aside from the door, consumed in thought. It can't go on for much longer than this, can it? His uncle looked at him. I don't know. I don't understand. But maybe not this time. On Marita's desk, next to his phone, was a piece of paper with the personal number of Komaki Nichiro. Marita was looking at it, wondering, as he had for some days now, whether to down an attempt to gain Hitachi support for the proposed police reform, which we're still trying to do. While well, considering his idea, the secretary placed the latest edition of the Tokyo Chunichi Shimbun on his desk, which he frequently read both for the familiarity of its Nagoya-based editorials and the refreshing nature of the liberal slam for as far as the home ministry allowed. Picking it up. Murita saw that the main story dealt with the state of policing in Manchukuo as he read. Murita's stomach turned, reports of brutal treatment and custody of men and women dragged from their homes in the night of the front of their screaming children, of indefinite detainment without trial or charge, of people simply vanishing off the street never to be seen again, of mutilated unidentifiable un bodies laying in ditches and floating down some rivers. Murita thought of Kamai of his employer Nisa under the connection to Manchukuo. Looking at the paper again, he realized that this is what would happen. If the Hitachi built the police force, that wouldn't happen, he thought, not in Guangdong, not on my watch, and threw the paper away. As you can see, we also finished a civil war in the Republic of Indo Indonesia, um, and we have PTRG profits, which we got most of it done. We actually got the heat one done, I think, but we didn't get the mountain one done, unfortunately, so. It is what it is, but we do have enough support for 52%. We had, uh, uh, this, will, this is what we'll get from it, but uh, we had Matsushita uh, come to us and, you know, work with us, and we got Sony and CK favoritism, which I'm okay with, so. So basically, military professionals will improve, highly increases a lot of stuff, decreases corruption by 3%. Uh, military professionals will improve even more. Mm, get more police support in all the states, which is fantastic. So Chinese Legion support. And because of monster shooting informants, we decrease security and military training. Whatever. It does decrease police support. Uh, we get basically plus 0.9 police control in all states. And the Japanese expats will like it too, so... It's a win-win for mostly everybody. Also... Even though we're doing this now, wait, what do you mean there's, uh, huh, no ordinances currently on the other state of council? We could also re go back and do smokestacks quit smoking, so we might actually do this maybe too. We'll see in the end though. I read this one last time, so if you read this again, please go ahead. Because after that, uh, we have to start working on other, uh, things here. Maybe the meaning of work? To live in Guangdong is work, and it's a bleak existence for those who toil on the factory floors or in the masses of office, office cubicles and from the name of the corporations. Corporations demand that clerks work past midnight for no recompense, while children work along the elderly in triple shifts on clear factory floors. Even the sympathetic Zhujin in Japanese, what few exist, can do little for the Chinese underclass for fear of being undercut by the more cutthroat competitors. While Sony and Chung Kong have done their level best to try and present a better deal for the Chinese and Zhujin blue collar workers, a competitive re reality is that Guangdong simply made altruism a losing power opposition in the face of the Zaibatsu. But now, with Marita and Li in the driver's seat, we can force everyone onto the same playing field. Passage of the public ordinance. Uh, public order ordinance. On a clear day in Koshu, the legislative council of the state of Guangdong remained peaceful even though a bill is being put to vote. It helped, of course, that the bill is entirely uncontroversial aside from the views of Kumai Kenshiro, who went off on a Jeremiah uh, against before it, just before the vote. 
Gentlemen, you need to understand that proposals misguided best for us in the camp by tie out of our fairs to the blunder. If we not have them, who will prevent the Japanese here from striking out on their own against or rebelling against the government? Who will prevent the Chinese and Zhujian communities from developing strange ideas about rebelling against a solitary concept of Pan-Asianism? We need the camp by town of Miyazaki, or else the whole state of Guangdong will become unprofitable. Come on, this man, not many people seem to buy into his argument, even, even if it's some of his own delegates were looking askance at him. It seems the vast majority of Guangdong's business community shared Morita's view that the camp by Tai ought to stop t sticking their rim horn glasses and annoying noses into comedy business. Given that and the mood of the room, it made sense that the ordinance passed without issue. As Lee nodded approvingly, Mazda should have joined him in approval, and he booked a talk to his delegates about how Morita made a good decision for once in his worthless life. Morita watched Kumai Lee, displeasure and anger at marring his features. Morita wondered why Kumai would get so heated over weakening the camp by Tai. His only hunch was that the man had interest with the camp by Tai, and possibly even the military that went deeper than he admitted, or everyone else suspected. Uh, dismissing the thought for now, Marita went to speak to the legislators. As we just went over, look at all the benefits we get. Also, we do have a, a drink here. A nice little ghost energy drink. Swedish fish flavor. Ah, delicious. 19%, not good enough, but the meaning of work. So then maybe we can do, go back and do this one, maybe. Uh, so we need, Ornus has fewer than five amendments. Uh, Position support. Of course, we still got a lot of stuff that we can do here still. Um, actually, there's not really that much. Oh, of course, we, guess it, we still have to do supermarket domination, I guess. Um, which will increase growth. And will give us more time to get things done, but... So we can only choose five. Introduce, following support. Well, well, we'll do both of these. One, two. You can't do both on the extreme side, so we might as well do one, two, three, four. I wouldn't mind getting better poverty, though. Poverty begin to improve. Mm -hmm. I don't want to reduce monster shoes seats by 10% either. Or maybe we'll buy dignity. How do you reward someone who gives their body, time, and freedom to the job? Li Kaxing believes that the answer is simple. Pay them more. To give people the recognition for their labor, and in doing so, give them the first means to their self-emancipation. Li acknowledges that his meteoric rise in Guangdong's corporate politics, clawing his way out of poverty, was a product of sharing the profits eked out by his partnership with Marita. Even the majority of the workers will never become capitalists themselves, it's not unreasonable to be sure that the masses are able to live off of the labor they provide and to clothe themselves in the dignity of work. Ooh, all right. We're supporting Sony here, but uh, that is terrible quality. Jesus Christ. Well, let's see. Target markets. Well, we did Brazil last time. I guess we're going to Mexico now. Product interests and quality. We can do this one, that's fine. Um, where are we for support from all these people here? 75% is capped at 95%, which is helping monthly corruption and real GDP growth and assimilation rate. Comprises 20% of the population. 64%, 65%. So we can spend more Japanese expat support, but not anyone else's support. How much approval do we have from Japan? Not enough, 86%. The Republic of China's approval is not bad either, though. So we can spend the political power, that's why I saved up a tiny bit here for us. So we could use it when we need it. And then you go to the meaning of work. Oh, the Karelian War. Look at that. Oh, increase the political power gain by 2%. Oh, yes, please. Initial minimum and maximum quality. God dang it. It's too late for that. Hey, almost 20% GDP growth. That is insane. It's not enough, of course. But when is it ever enough for us, really? Ten percent, huh? Oh, oh, here we go with this stuff. If we join it, I hope we get properly recompensed for it. Thirty-one percent. It's low. Loan engineers from Japan. We could. So far, we rely on our own men to design and develop our latest product. Well, normally, they are perfectly adequate for our needs if we want to go above and beyond the standard quality the market's used to. We need to pull from Japan's considerable talent pool. By pulling in our contacts with our offices in the home aisles, we can arrange to have the best engineering talent this year to offer transfer temporarily to our current products here in Guangdong. Some feathers may get ruffled here and there as we pull high-demand skilled labor for our own needs, but all loans... Uh, will be repaid in full, no matter, no, have no fear. A shot of the West. From the moment shots were reported in Western Guizhou, Guangdong was filled with shock. 
Reports came flooding in through the day as a host of intelligence agencies and local administrators attempted to cobble together a timeline and plan of action. By the time it landed on Marita Kao's desk, the report had grown into a mess, full enough of retractions and updates to strain the manila envelope in a game. Still, the basics were clear. Long Yun, a Chinese warlord once reduced to playing second fiddle to his cousin's government, had reinstated himself and began a campaign to remove China from the sphere by force with the help of allied anti-Japanese armies in the West. Now just a few hours away from Guangdong, the rebellious army threatened to destroy the stability of the entire Chinese region. Despite himself, Marita Kale could not help but feel the weight of the threat, yet his options were limited. The product testing group and IJA Garrison needed to stay at home in case war, the war worsened. Worse, a note from the Chinese government had been tucked into the envelope ordering Guangdong to not do anything directly lest Nanjing be delegitimized further. Now, for now, the chief executive would have to be have to wait. Stick to putting out fires at home. It would be enough of a challenge alone. The investors, the IJA, the corporations, and all would be on high alert so long as the war roared. Until the war's end, every man and woman in Guangdong would see a plain truth. The violent end of the corporate experiment lay just around the corner. We sent inches from a fire and cannot put it out. I'll do this once, why not? Right now, police control is actually pretty solidified. A new age for labor? Because 32 over here is very good. 34 is pretty darn awesome. 31 is decent. And even down here, we're only 10 away, 6 away from the triads. Here we are 12 away, here we are quite away, 23 away, and 12 away here, so it's interesting. Uh, when the new, uh, new Morita government of Guangdong announced its government programs designed to improve working conditions and better treatment for the average worker, the Lee family joined many other families throughout the Rebel Delta in responding with no small degree of cynicism. The father, Leong, reminded the rest of the family that these kinds of programs, while they have been done before, were best haphazardly implemented, and then taken away the moment things seemed to uh, deteriorate. Um, taking his father's words in mind, Li Chuan concluded that all he could do uh, was hope was to work for another day and bring the basic necessities home to his family. At the factory that day, Chuan was distracted from his work <clears throat> uh, by a call for attention by a Japanese factory manager, one of the scummier ones, Okusuma Sogo. He ordered all the workers to drop what they were doing and clean the place up for a VIP visit tomorrow. Uh, they be let out early, but they were expected to make up the hours later. Chun sighed, as always with his factory. There was something, nothing new under the sun. But as he thought about how to best adopt the development, he failed to notice a single individual in the back of the room silently watching the proceedings. That individual, grabbing a small bag left near the manager, walked away. Ensure dignity, huh? By safety first, Morita believe it is far more reasonable to assume that the dissatisfaction of the Chinese and Zhujian workers in Guangdong stems from the mortal danger they face on a daily basis. Our workplaces are more often resemble houses of horrors where unsecured equipment and space economization mean that a simple mistake or misstep or freak accident results in death or a crippling injury. By drafting and instituting basic safety restrictions, we can credibly claim to be improving a lot of workers to the standards Sony and Chung Kong aim to provide while forcing our competitors to be held accountable to the same level. We claim the rationale of improving productivity and an obligation to provide for worker safety against our detractors, but surely they must recognize that they would benefit from the continued survival of a skilled workforce. So, increases Guangdong safety standards and increases Sony's initial support for the ordinance, which is good too. Oof. Bet the Kampai Tite has products. Uh, I don't want more corruption though, you know? Suppress negative press. The question of quotas. Will the Western insurrection only growing more deadly? The reports of refugees become a constant element of Morita Kao's daily briefings. A mass of ten cities rose on practically every major road in Guangdong and is by his government's estimations. Some 3,000 illegals have entered the nation in just the last few months. Clearly, a refugee policy would need to be needed in the short term. Yet, the question of who'd accept was murky for the chief executive. It pitted two long-held industrial maxims against each other. Quantity versus quality. On the one hand, most refugees. Um... Uh or completely unskilled, farmers and day laborers that could do little for local industry that could not be done by your average citizen. A policy which limited new arrivals to only educated specialists may provide the best quality. It requires some expense to maintain a largely closed border, but for that cost, Guangdong could extract the best of China while maintaining a limited and effective population. On the other hand, Guangdong always needed its share of labor. Refugees would not only make for uh, acceptable factory workers, but would likely accept low pay and provisions without hesitation. But after all, they were, by definition, uh, low on options. Uh, for the cost of their housing and nourishment, an open-door policy could keep the factory staff for years without any need for direct recruitment. Soon, Morita Kale caught up with the secretary. A decision been made. The chief executive chose quantity and let them in. Increases Chinese government support and growth by 0.05% versus chief executive chose quality and closed his doors. Zhujin support? I don't even need more Chinese support. All roads lead to Koshu, twice exiled. Um, hmm. Well, let's come up here. So right now, 
gives you more growth. Republic of China's uh, Republic of China opinion cap. I want more Zhujin. Zhujin are very good to have, but we need more support. Monthly corruption goes down. I like more monthly corruption going down. Let me do that one. Question of hours. Um, this is nice and all. Question of work hours. The minimum wage. Poverty will begin to slowly improve. Disability insurance. I like that. It doesn't reduce any like seats at all. And it does give you Chung Kong seats, but it does give you improved poverty, which I'm I'm shooting for for the most part here. Disability insurance. With the rate of workplace accidents in Guangdong, all it takes is one stroke of misfortune to wipe out one's savings and condemn them to a life of poverty on the streets. Uh, the disabled eke out a truly wretched existence as beggars. On the street of the three pearls, their knees and foreheads bloodied uh, from scrapping asphalt, groveling for change from an increasingly desensitized populace. For workers' sake, as a business opportunity, we should encourage us to see all the disability insurance contracts and factories and workplaces across Guangdong. An accident need not spell the end of a person's life, for even while a maimed man may provide value, a dead man provides none. Very true. Cool. Good, we're working on all this stuff. This stuff doesn't really matter. 1966, we'll go back to the grenades. Because we like grenades here. Eh, still could be better, but whatever. Can we send them volunteers? Buying dignity. But safety first. Murray and friend come calling. Well, and that good for nothing rice bucket of a man Okuma had said that there was a very important guest visiting the factory. Lee China dis disbelieved him, but still jumped to the opportunity to quit work early for once, even if it would be forced to give up more of the day later on. Now the visitor, the chief executive, Marita Keo himself, was looking around the factory. The factory was spick and span, the workers. Even Chun himself thought he resented it, though he resented it, were on the best behavior. For Chun, was, this, made, was, this was made difficult by the rubbish that Okuma was spewing. The manager waxed. A poetic about how well treated everyone was, how happy they were to work here because it meant they could provide for themselves and their families. <coughs> uh, to Chun's surprise, Marita was not taken in by Okuma's little pep talk, merely nodding shortly. Uh, he turned to the well dressed official next to him. Had Chun looked around yesterday, he would have found that this man was also one standing around behind him. This man, Li Kishing, asked Okuma if everyone in the factory was well paid and allowed to leave on time. Okuma scoffed and said what Chun knew was a lie, of course they are. Then Lee picked up a tape recorder and played back Okuma's words from yesterday, ordering the workers to make up the early hours later on. Okuma turned pale as it played back, then rallied. Chief Executive, you and this good for nothing have set me up to embarrass my company and the Empire Japan. Lee merely pointed at Chun and spoke in Cantonese. You over there? Chun was surprised. Yes, what, me, sir? Lee nodded, yes, you. You just heard the recording. It may be familiar to you. Please tell me who, between me and manager Okuma, here is telling the truth about what is happening yesterday. Or what happened yesterday. Chun smirked. Once in a while, just could be fun. This is a little world. Well, Mr. Lee, you're telling the truth here. Hmm. Twice exiled, a torrential rain had descended upon the border camp by day earlier, and it carelessly remained since. It left the makeshift barricades and slick and reflective, and turned the already soft ground to thick mud. By nightfall, those remaining the sneaking lines of checkpoints and patrols were left shivering and dirty. The clothes stuck to their bodies from the downpour, the shoes soaked through an inch deep in sludge. It was in the lines that Zhang Junfeng tried to cross into Guangdong after four heckish, torturous hours. He was rejected just like everyone else. And all that time, he'd only seen a few men enter. He met just one, an engineer named Gan, who fled from Ningyuan when the NPA insurrection spilled across the border. Zhang had a similar story down to the city of origin. Alas, uh, Zhang was a merchant, not an engineer. Guangdong, it seemed, had more than enough merchants already. Uh, Zhang never gave up Paul, but even his feet began to lose the feeling, and the fellow refugees collapsed around him. There would be another way, and perhaps in Guangxi, where the border patrols were a little weaker. Uh, he'd be a little hungrier by the time he arrived, a little thinner, but he had a uh, life force to drain. Better to burn that last bit of stamina searching for exits than to stay here and let it be snuffed up by the NPA bullets. All that mattered was, of course, escaping. Uh, the front lines had escaped from the border camps. In truth, the two were not so different. Even before the war arrived, the camps were already sinking into the dirt. And Guangxi, Zing would find another, another answer, no matter how bitter. You never know, you know? Sometimes you get the answers you don't like. Which sucks, but that's life. Safety first, and the disability insurance would be good. Um, let's see. Minimum wage. Slowly improve. I do want to overhaul the building code, though, because that would help us with uh, poverty. The haphazard, uncoordinated state. 
of construction and urban planning across much of Guangdong, and the three brothers had left their factories and residential neighborhoods a little tinderbox, uh, an architectural nightmare prone to total and catastrophic failure and adverse conditions. Uh, improved ventilation, fire escapes, flame-resistant materials, and pro proper concrete addressing even some of those would make workplaces and tenements much safer, giving much, some much-needed reassurance to the Chinese in Zhujim, who toiled without knowing if an errant spark or rusty rivet would be the death of them. And we might be able to take uh, some of the renovations work ourselves. Like I said, it helps with poverty, it adds a little more Chung Kong seats, but honestly, Chung Kong is not the most important thing here. They're always a minor party compared to where we're at, so... Which is gonna suck for them, but you know, whatever. It is what it is, but twice forgotten. Even the bars of Guangzhou seem alien to Gan. Since they arrived in the city, it spent months searching for authentic Chinese liquors. But every bar worth going to seemed to only provide Japanese imports or a smattering of disgusting industrial wines. Even in Purple Sun, the bar Gan finally settled on served sake, not Hyongju. Gan didn't come here for alcohol, not really. He came for the ritual of beer, a newspaper from the box parked outside, and an hour of drinking and reading about insurrection after work each day. Lonely as it was, the ritual provided a simple comfort for Gan. For an hour, Gan got to remember his past in China and remind himself why he remained in Guangdong. Occasionally, he would notice his Japanese workers as they crammed into a booth and drunkenly chatted about the firm. Who was on the rise? Who was making a booty of themselves? He listened a few times to see if they ever mentioned his name, and never seemed to come up, though. The slight stung, but not too badly. In the last few months, Gan had come to accept how the Japanese saw him. It wasn't a cruel antipathy. The Japanese admired him and enjoyed him. They certainly paid him well, that he could feel the underlying beliefs behind their cheer. To the Japanese, a Chinese engineer was like a child prodigy, a credit to his people, an idle curiosity, lost in a sea of co-workers, and that which followed. Though Li Chun had smirked as he watched Chief Executive Morita make a mockery of the good-for-nothing Okuma, he was still processing what just happened some ten or day so days after the man's visit. Okuma and his boss, Matsuda. I have been publicly ordered to do right by his workers and obey the labor laws for once, and were told that occupational health and safety audits would be scheduled for his workplace on a regular basis. When Hay and Y had heard that for once, somebody had been looking out for the average citizen, they had been overjoyed. At last, the joy had turned into disappointment when Chun came home that evening, having been laid off along with the entire shift of his employees. Earlier in that day, Chun, although sad and was not particularly surprised, this was the way of a common person's life in Guangdong, after all, one step forward anywhere from two to 200 back. Chun was roused from his musings by a shout from the front door of his home. He had mail and was important. It was a recruitment letter straight from the upper management at the Chung Kong conglomerate, which Chun remembered was owned by Li Kaxing, a native Chinese that Chun had seen with Marita at the factory. I said that they could always use a pair of steady hands like his and that they would give him good pay. But Li Chun found some uh, found with some shock that for once he didn't really care about those things. Quite the contrary, in fact. No, Chun's mind was filled with thoughts of working at Chung Kong. Marita comes calling when there was good for nothing rice bucket of a man. Okuma had said that there was a very important guest visiting the factory. Li Chun had disbelieved him. Uh, oh, did I just read this? Uh, but uh, had disbelieved him, but still jumped at the opportunity to quit work early for once, even if it would be forced to give up more of the day later now. Now the visitor, the chief executive, Marita Keo himself, was looking around the factory. Uh, the factory was spick and span, and the workers, even Chun himself, though he resented, were on the best behavior, which is what I read it earlier. So basically, you do the same thing twice. It's interesting. Marita nodded nonchalantly about how the manager was talking about how well the workers were treated, but then like a bullet of blue, I abruptly made a beeline for the door off to the side. Okuma turned pale. He knew quite well the door led to the real factory floor. However, despite the protest, Marita opened the door and walked in, followed by a gibbering Okuma, a curious chun, and the rest of the factory workers. Marita noted out loud, Mr. Okuma, these machines are well used, worn, and above all, quite unsafe. What do you have to say about this? Okuma stammered out, sir, maybe someone uh, working here hasn't taken care of the machines. Marita looked out as unconvinced as Chun felt, but what the chief executive did next surprised him. He snapped at the today in Cantonese, yes, in Cantonese. Tell it to your workers. A terrible sound took over the room. As the sounds deepened, Marita pointed a finger at the humiliated manager still speaking in Cantonese. So, Kumo, you better get your act together, or so help me, I'll see this place shut down faster than you can. Cried Banzai. And though somewhat shocked by the way he saw, Chun smirked. So, do two different things that could happen there. Interesting. And up next, we're going to do this. I'll hold a massive press conference, because right now, we are interest is not high, but the quality is middling. Is what it is, you know. Disability insurance, a grand opening. But Li Kishin was opening a new part of his increasingly large Chung Kong conglomerate, an insurance firm. And the crowd of employees gathered to listen to their boss of bosses talk. Two employees, one Chinese, a woman named Quan Liu Lam, and another Zhujin man called Chan Man Hai, were listening. Man Hei was running a live translation for a Hu Lam, who unfortunately couldn't understand much more than hello, goodbye, and darn it in Japanese. It was a fairly standard corporate pep talk at the beginning. Do your job. It's an exciting new frontier in the financial world. Great opportunity for everyone to grow, mature, and gain experience. Really proud of everyone's achievements thus far. Oh, we can't do this one yet. Darn it. Um, but near the end, uh, Hugh Lam, Man He, and everyone else was surprised. Mr. Lee took off his glasses and told the assembled crowd something much less conventional. Uh, before I end off, please allow me to offer one big piece of advice. Don't just, don't just think of this as a product, but as a chance to say to our clients that if an accident happens, Jung Kong is here to take care of you. 
later on over a pleasant lunch. He and Lam and Man Hei had a chat. Thanks for translating Mr. Lee's speech for me, Man Hai. My Japanese really isn't that great, even though I was one of the few kids in my neighborhood that made it to high school. Man Hei simply nodded and said it was no problem. At that, he and Lam smiled. You don't know how happy that makes me. You know, I was coming here, I expected that. Seeing as how I'm a second-class Chinese student only useful for talking to clients, I'll be a lot more alone. They only want to send money to my parents. The only big dream I've got is to help them against an off chance something goes horribly wrong in one of those factory heck holes, like it is for so many of my friends' par parents. Man Hayden nodded in acknowledgement. Maybe things will get changed now. Even if they don't, the Hugh Lam, I've got your back. Hugh Lam, smiled of thanks in a prologue. Yasukawa Yoshiko, accompanied by our government uh, minder, Hayashi Kozen, was on the hunt in Koshu, seeking a good story. He was unfortunately hobbled and was pursued by the fact that she could speak essentially no Cantonese except for hello, how are you, goodbye, and drop dead. <laughs> Eventually, she had to set up for talking to a Japanese factory owner who brained her, or who brained when he saw her, he had been looking for a journalist to vent to. The man, Matsu, Matsuda Fujito by his name, had a lot of vent about. Those good for nothing bureaucrats are strangling the industry in the city. With all the thrice darn government health regulations that's taking away my profits and making conditions worse in my factory. The interview continued on in this vein for a good 30 minutes. Yoshiko thought it would be credible and accepted it at face value until he saw that Officer Hayashi, her minder, clearly uncomfortable, was rolling his eyes at what Matsuda was saying every now and then. After the interview ended, Yoshiko asked the officer why he was so uncomfortable. Hayashi was blonde, all level with you, Miss Yasukawa. That man is 100% not telling, telling you the full story. I have on very good authority that the factory was in effect a notorious sweatshop, and if you talked to, to any of the Cantonese speakers in the area, you'd find out that sooner that I could say Konbanwa, but that's to be expected, given how you only know how, how to say, I hope your whole family gets run over in Cantonese. Huh. Yoshiko, a bit hurt by yeah, Hayashi's bluntness, fired back. Well, now what's the real story, Mr. Hayashi? Hayashi calls him. Lam Has... How Xian, that is, was surprised by his development and mulled over his next course of action. Perhaps it might do her some good to jump down this rabbit hole. Hey, look, no man, no political power. Who needed it, right? So right now, where are we at? 42 votes. God bless America. Well, that's a lot of votes we need to muster up, isn't it? Wait, how many votes do we have for Matsushita? Jesus Christ. We can get two more seats there. We're going to need a lot of uh, spending political power, I'll put it like that. We can still go over here too, though. But I don't, I don't want to further reduce Matsushita seats and Fujitsu seats. Uh, I mean, it's not bad to do, but. Poverty rain needs to get better, though. Yeah. Did I read this? Yeah. Overhauling the building code. There you go. Slowly improve. Reduces Matsushita and Fujitsu seats barely. It really reduces Matsushita seats, which we can't afford. And reduces it further, so. Reduces it by 5%. 5% is better than 10%. Yeah. Even if Sony and Chung Kong take pains to ensure that their offices and factories are not little death traps for their employees. Lack of a standardized safety and workplace environment standard for laborers and office workers alike means that other corporations will have all the leeway they need to treat their employees as disposable cogs and not humans. And Sony and Chung Kong have to play down to their level. If we have the power to do something about it, then we can use this opportunity to make Matsushita, uh, or Matsushitya, Fujitsu and Hitachi play on our level for once. If their investors have a problem with it, we can simply ask them. Will they be willing to subject their employees on the home islands to the same conditions they require those in Guangdong? No matter how they reply, the people will know that we are right. And we need more growth. We're going to have deficit. Who's scared about the GDP ratio? we got to buy seats. <sighs> Desperate measures. 5% is just too much for a single vote. 33 days left. Average profitability. Quality is not bad. Uh, 3%. Push forward by 10 days. Overall, the building code. An inspection. A government worker walked into the dilapidated tenement somewhere in Koshu on his way to speak with his owners. He couldn't find his way around, so he was happy to find a young boy playing with something in one of the rundown hallways. Where are you going, mister? Oh, hello there, young man. I need to speak to the owners. Why's that? I'm here from the government. This building isn't even safe for a rat to live in, let alone your, pe your poor people. I need to get to whoever owns this place to straighten it up. Let go's orders. Well, it's all nice and all, mister, but it won't work. All the owner ever does is shout about money and doesn't listen to anybody. Be as it may, I need to talk to him. Well, if that's what you want, his office is out of way. The worker walked off towards the office. Within five minutes, everyone in that tenement could hear a loud argument. They went on for half an hour. They could tell that the worker was trying and failing to argue on their behalf. When the worker came out, he was visibly dejected. He said his case, but to no avail. There was no legal penalty. There was exactly nothing he could force a brute of a landlord to do. As the worker walked towards the exit, he noticed the eyes of the people of the tenement on him. Just as he was about to walk back out on the street, he felt a poke to his side. It was a boy from before running up to him with a small flower he had found. Thanks, mister. Nobody stood up for us before. 
The rookie kept that flower on him for the rest of his life. Hmm. We're gonna have to get pitch it to the Japanese here. We need more political power, god dang it. I get rushing his forward a little bit more. I want to invest just a tiny bit more in here first. But we need that C, man. Uh, not that, uh, fine. 0.29%. Not great. But it's below 40% still, so. Because we're going to slowly start working on all, on all these seats. Because we didn't have even a single Hitachi seat. So we do this. Sure, dignity. Way more cost. Uh, token regulations with moderate regulations. Highly decreases industrial regulations. Increases sewing seats by one. Poverty will begin to rapidly improve. So really help out poverty. Worker safety. Pa! It was a rainy, grim day outside Fujitsu's Koshu's office. Made worse by the ponderous uh, of smog. They made sense then. Ibuka, then his guest, Komaki and Shiro rather than complaining about the weather, were instead consumed with quiet rage with the antics of Morita Keo and Li Kishin. Ibuka scoffed in displeasure after hearing Komaki's recounting of Morita and Li's plans, and went off in yet another tirade. Those accursed booting hearts are trying to drag the rest of Guangdong to the mediocre level. It's my right to run Fujitsu as I please. Excellence, no tolerance for mediocrity, and I won't brook any violations to it. Unfortunately, that idiot Matsushita, a human weather vane, as always, will probably go along with a stupid plan. Kamai, affable as always, asks a simple question. It's, it's so stupid, why not just ignore it? Uh, Ibuka looked at his, his ally strangely and made a retort somewhat, but not entirely. Laden with sarcasm, it must be a great time for you people, Manchukuo. You don't have... Uh, give a god darn about workers' rights since everyone in the country of yours is just a drone. If a worker gets injured, you just fire him and get a new one from the somewhere, and that does double if the one that dies. Then again, Ibuka thought not worrying about that stuff did allow Hitachi to carry on unfettered, which is even a plus to him. The expression of Kamai's face did not change. Yes, that's the case. What of it? Ibuka kept looking at him strangely. Kamai cleared his throat and continued on. Well, you're just staying for a superior methods aside. You're completely right. We've got no obligation to worry about workers' rights unless the Lugka forces their hands on the matter. I, for one, have no plan or reason to obey such an unreasonable mandate. Ibuka nodded his agreement, nor indeed do I. I think I read this one before, so if you read this again, please go right ahead. Yep. So we'll do this one. We'll do the Memorial Hospital. Um, and we're also going to do this one just because we are... Uh, Really cramped for time and whatnot, because we need seven more seats. Good God. Follow the money. You aren't under investigation, Chief Yamatani. Police Commissioner Mori addressed a lone bureaucrat sitting at Ramrod straight across from himself in Likushing, but Chief Executive has authorized financial audits of the civil service. We have to get a horse, a horse, our house in order. The audits are not public, but you need to know that there may be disruptions to your sections to work, Lee continued. Smiling, uh, Yama Yamatani, hands folded neatly on his knees, his comb over not a millimeter out of order, not eagerly or sagely, even as the beast sweat trickled down his neck. Crap! Yamatani mumbled, fighting to keep his foot from fidgeting as he surveyed the line of uh, depositors ahead of him. He wasn't an idiot, everything under his name was clean, and he waited a few days after a more in his lease notice before making his move, but he couldn't leave loose ends. He had to close the books. How can I help you, mister? The bank teller looked up, smiling, Yamatani. Uh, felt the clawing heat of the street sticking to his back, a sweat drenching his shirt. Uh, Kakimoto, I'm Kakimoto Shingo. I need to close my account. I'll be right with you. The teller's eyes widened as she rose, backing away as footsteps approached. Section Chief Yamatani, you're under arrest. A pair of arms bent Yamatani's uh, arm behind his back and rustled him down against the counter. What? Why? Yamatani protested, a chill running up his clammy spine. I've done nothing wrong here. Yes, but you were going to. Let's open those books, shall we? As we're doing Memorial Hospital now, and now we're going to come back to this side and do uh, just incentives. Yeah. Punishing the corrupt has ever been popular among the people, else Marita wouldn't have campaigned so hard for it. More than proving that the justice is still alive in Guangdong, public displays of contrition meant of, from men of ill-gotten wealth satisfies their supposed lessers on a visceral level. Retribution only deters men from error, however. The desires which lead them to it will still remain. For the part, our public servants desire financial security in a city with more expenses than anywhere else. As such, the chief executive believes a review of the civil authorities' pay scales is long overdue. For the state of Wallace, us inclined to seek dirty money, and a lot of Wallace will leave Guang the government house stated once the review concludes. The CV 2000 VTR. As uh, home television sets have become more common in Guangdong and the sphere as a whole, people have become familiar with a very modern frustration. Missing your favorite show. Your bus is late or you have to work overtime or you just over sleep and now you have to scour the TV guide hoping to catch a rerun. So any plans to make that a thing of the past? A new CV 2000 VTR. Once attached to a TV, can be set to record a certain channel at a certain time for up to an hour. The content of the broadcast will be encoded onto a strip of magnetic tape, which the VTR can then play back at any time the user chooses, allowing viewers to make sure they never miss their favorite programs. The new device has already drawn concerns from several major film studios who worry that people will record TV broadcasts of movies and sell them on the black market. They even already coined an appropriate or alarmist phrase, video piracy. Nevertheless, the general public seems eager to be able to watch your favorite shows at a time of the choosing. Don't be a prisoner of any programming schedule anymore. Nice. So average uh, product cycle reaching 66.25%. We'll get one more seat, which is not bad. And we market it towards Mexicans. Fantastic. 
This, however, is not fantastic. But that does give us more seats, so that way we can get, bribe more seats here. So three more seats there will help, help out, and then we need three more seats from like these rest three, which is going to take forever. It's part one of 1946. Oh, god dang it. The men in khaki colored uniforms returned to the village. An entourage of sharply dressed, besuited businessmen accompanied them. The villagers stood and watched as they knocked on the headman's door. Lamps stood among them, el softly elbowing his way forward. When the headman emerged from his home, the interpreter for the Japanese group began. Hello, he said. We've come to discuss business terms. Can we come in? The spring sun cast beaded shadows on the interpreter's brow, streaming down. No, the headman said. Whatever you got to say, you can say it here. The headman spat at the shoes of the business entourage when the soldier stepped forward to strike one of those suited sleeves halted the offender in his tracks. He spoke prompting the interpreter to continue. No need to be violent, I fear, he said. We've only come here to make an offer to open an open offer to every one of you. Uh, interrupt, an interpreter paused, trying to find the right word. Peasants, farmers, fishermen, the headmen eyed him. Out with it. At a signal from the businessman, the interpreter turned to the crowd. Well, he said, raising his voice, we wish to offer a business proposition. We've seen your village, and the property in which it dwells and is in our hands to offer a solution. We'll provide food, work, tools, in exchange for a few of your fine young men to whom we will grant employment and the reconstruction of the provinces. That is acceptable. It was quiet for a long instant. Then a villager threw an egg at the interpreter. Jeers, insults, and laughter broke out as a platoon of men formed a circle to protect the entourage. They pushed their way through the crowd, rifles barred with bayonets unfurled. Just before they stepped off the village gate, the lamps rode forward and shouted, Wait! Another silence, I'll go, he said, sh voice shaking. They could feel the burning eyes of his relatives on him. I'll go, he said again louder. The Japanese took him in as the rancor and clamor raged again behind him. When the winds blow eastward, is it wrong for ships to sail therewith? God, we're going to have so much corruption. It's only going up by 0.28 every month, which is not bad in memory. Oh, God. The chief executive's voice was, uh, office was a perfect reflection of Maritza's vision for Guangdong. Slick, cutting edge, and smartly designed. On the right corner from the entrance, next to the floor, uh, to the ceiling, tinted glass windows, stood three Eames lounge chairs clustered around a solid mahogany lacquered coffee table. The whole ensemble illuminated by the arc of lamp, overarching above the heavy crystal glasses, off of which light dissected as if to form a myriad of shards. There the diarch sat, sip sipping imported whiskey, pondering on the issues of the modern age while soaking in the most distinctive vista. As Lee picked up the evening paper, which the secretary just brought in, fresh from the print, he was appalled to read of yet another workplace fatality. Marita, this is unacceptable. How can such a disregard for human life? ever be conceivable. Simple, not all are so enlightened to us consider the Chinese fellow humans. Then why don't we set an example for them, Marita? Maybe if we cannot instill into their minds such a simple thing as the value of human life, why don't we make them see how much life is worth, Mo monetarily? Ibuka and Matsushita would probably listen, but convincing Kamai would be a fool's errand. Calm down. There's something we can do. Our duty. Good enough. As for what to do, there's a hospital proposal that comes up here and there, and we could work on it. CK could provide the real estate and manpower to run it, and while Sony could provide specialized equipment and doctors. That sounds good, but one, would one hospital suffice? As a fa matter of fact, Marita, no, it would not, but it could be a so-called base there from which we do incorporate the small various private clinics dotting the cities. Or to build a solid and robust fulcrum from which to do gradually expand. One day everyone shall be covered, not one shall fall through the net. Speaking of nets, interdict Marita, those anti-suicide nets we had installed are working great, which is not a good sign. The healthcare system should cover the issues causing people to make the leap. Every worker producing makes the bottom line grow, and that much is obvious, but every happy worker makes society grow, making the pie for us to share larger. I see then that we have an understanding. I'll inform the health commissioner first thing next morning, and I'll ask to start analyzing data to begin writing pertinent legislation establishing this memorial hospital. Oh, one minor thing before I leave. How should we call it? Uh, one Chai Memorial Hospital will be good enough. No need for grandeur. Okay. I need to take action next. Increase corruption by 2%, 1.5%. Seen, extend senior bonuses. A sort of counterintuitive logic that would make the chief executives more zealous allies balk out of both principle and thrift. Let the senior executives pocket more of the government's money, and they might not pocket the company's Companies in exchange for favors. Men expect little change from the men, with long history of scandal and grift. Marita thinks otherwise. Loyalty is a pulse that drives Guangdong. Money stimulates it like jolts of electricity. Carefully applied money, in conjunction with punishments under the worst examples, will signal the government's privilege that their employer desires their loyalty more than Matsushita, Hitachi, or Fujitsu. Finding a niche. One more thing Ramon said as he reached into his pockets to toss one a uh, bundle of American dollars. Now get going, you're wasting the morning. Juan started his truck and began traveling towards the border station. Uh, the drive from the Mexican warehouse in Nuevo Laredo uh, to his American counterpart in Laredo only took about 15 minutes, 20 on a bad day. Juan glanced, uh, glanced through the back window, happy to see that all the goods that survived the many puddles littering the roads. Arriving at the border, he squabbled briefly with the border officer and demanded twice the usual rate for his services, forcing Juan to hand him an even more extortionate bribe than usual. Upon arriving at the Texan warehouse, Juan disabled the engine and leaned over the window to greet the American manager. Broken English, he communicated, same as always, Sony Electronics fresh from Japan, from Japan. Juan hesitated a moment, board is tattered now, our rate just went up to 30%. Finally, this better be good, the American scowled before directing a half dozen American men and load the truck, bringing the boxes, brightly marked Sony, into the warehouse. Uh, Juan started his truck and began traveling back towards the border station. This run had been fairly smooth, all things considered, only a few more dozen to go. 
That's one way to make a living. And actually, poverty's getting slightly better. Slightly. Because of healthcare. Good job, healthcare. As we're adjusting incentives, and then we'll do that one, and then reward workforce dedication. A man from North Point composed a letter to his parents in the city outskirts asking for financial aid. He put, Bob, my life in Shenzhen is terrible. I leave home at 6 in the morning, come back at 10 in the evening. I clean messes people leave behind, and I get paid trinkets for honest work while Bob smokes opium and bro pockets bribes in his office. After paying the mailman's tea money, he opened, cut open the brown envelope containing the reply. Outspelled banknotes worth several thousand yen and in a letter. Flipping it open, he read, Get a better job, we didn't raise the street sweeper. Baba, he wrote in his own response later that month, I'm a clerk in government house. At least they pay st street sweepers, pensions. Our civil servants overworked and underpaid, and so jaded they make p punch lines out of themselves in private. Is it any wonder they become inside men for corporations willing to pay their rent? This must change, says the chief executive. Nice. A quick reboot. The chief executive position in Guangdong uh, is a busy one, with constant meetings to attend, reports to sort through, and orders to authorize. On most days, the reporter talking to the TV, the conversation in the hallways, surrounding the office office, and the headlines in the daily paper were nothing more than just simple distractions. But Marita Keo noticed one country's name being said across all three mediums for the past week, Colombia. And he began to ask his closest advisors about Colombia, how there had been a stalemate for years, suddenly erupting into a wide-scale conflict, how the mainland government was expected to support one of the factions fighting the conflict, how the IJA and IJN were constantly complaining about their updated equipment, and just like that, he suddenly remembered how one of Suzuki's old projects had been defunct for a while now. Huh. The Product Testing Group Research research group sounded like an ordinary uh, research and development team from one of the many Guangdong's companies, but it was instead a weapons development team working in tandem with the IJA and IJN to ensure the Japanese military was always one step ahead of its adversaries. Companies would submit prototype weapon designs to the PTRG, and then the Army and the Navy would actually go out and test the prototypes. The group had been put on the back burner since the Astuta crisis, but there are dozens of project ideas that can be considered after uh, the uh, Indonesia. The chief executive would spend the rest of the day afternoon pitching the idea again to his contacts in the Army and Navy, who were excited to hear that the program was being restarted. Yay! They always stressed their need for more reliable, more effective equipment, and if Guangdong companies, one of them, could provide it, the profits would make from the most other products launches looks like failures. For Marita Keo, failure was never an option uh, for surviving in Guangdong, and the PTRG could be no exception to that rule. One country's loss is another's gain. Ah, fantastic. PTRGs, huh? Experimental Spart divisions. Which one do we like? New Granada? Yeah, I guess so. Have fun! Don't get too many men killed off, but you know, it is what it is. So, for this one, what do we need? Desperate measures, probably. Jungles, mountains, river crossings, equipment. Rainy, stormy. Pretty normal. Big announcement. The Guangdong police bullet in the banana that one fine day in Koshu, Simonakus, until one read the last few lines and realized just how important it was. Our intention to increase the budget for the personnel review pay standards and bonuses in light of the prevailing economic conditions and the living needs of the Guangdong police. The last clause confused everyone in the police uh, force. So far as Lam Hyun Su knew, it was the first time that the clause about economic conditions and living needs had been used to refer to a prospective pay increase. He had no idea what it meant, nor did any of his colleagues or superiors know. Even the people he disliked the most were united with him in confusion, in a fit of desperation. He took the bullet into Yasukawa Yoshiko and asked her, What on earth could this mean, Mr. Yasukawa? Everyone I know is stumped. Yoshiko hit her glee into being one of the one informing Mr. Hayashi about something rather than the other way around and told him her hypothesis. Well, it's not just a war, I think, but a care, too. The thinking I've heard is that corruption begins because the rank and file aren't paid enough to turn crime up to make the difference. Now I'm so confused, but why in heaven's name are they going to find the money for all that? Don't they know how many of us there are? You should go to Mirror. I don't know about either, Mr. Hayashi, but then again, if the government is looking to fire corrupt officers, maybe they could redirect some of that into your wallet. Lamb nodded, though. He was still confused. More money? Yes, please. More stability, please? Please. Look at all the experience these guys got. Fantastic. Um, there's jungles. Do we need jungles? I don't think we need jungles, do we? Rainy equipment. Carry out river crossings. No. So, we'll be fine here in the mountains. Good God, we're going to die, aren't we? Well, we won't. Our soldiers will. It's all right. It happens. Hey, investments. Good. Increases student profitability. Increases our uh, product interest. Because, my God, is product interest so low, it's not freaking funny. And we need to bribe more people. Because right now, we're only at 46%. God dang it. I hate this so much. The Columbia Command. They've done it again, haven't they? Takashima. Tell me it isn't true. Takashima, Consul General of Japan and the city of Guangdong had nothing to offer but a sigh. Yes, I've done it again, General. I got to say I was in his hands and he said, Spill it up then. What nonsense have they scribbled up this time? It's an interlock. 
interlocutor. So I read it out loud. The city of Guangdong has, in the interest of supporting the strategic goals of the Imperial Japanese Army and the government of the Great Japanese Empire, declared the deployment of a volunteer research division to the Colombian Civil War. I thought the general slammed his fist on the table. Infuriating. Imperial Japanese Army soldiers and my soldiers are once again going to be sent to a fight in a foreign war, a war of choice for us, without the equipment tried and tested for the cause. They're going to be, gu be guinea pigs for scientists who don't understand a single darn word of why they fight. The Consul General sighed, and Agano continued, and I'm supposed to look these men in the eye as the rifles break down on them the day in and day out, as the weapons and supplies prove all more reliable because of some thrice darn egghead scientist made them without knowing how real combat works and t tell them they're doing the right thing when all they're really doing is serving the Chief Executive's money grubbing interests. By now, his voice had crescendoed into a shell. I hate this, Takashima. I hate this so much. Well, I hate doing a lot of things too, but sometimes we have to. The Outsiders. Even if Chief uh, Executive Morita and Li Keqing promised the world to Guangdong's Zhujin community, the reality power dictated that not everyone got everything they wanted. Or trading favors, back scratching, these were time honored traditions, and the rise of Guangdong's uh, two most prominent Zhujin hardly changed that. As the months passed by, uh, following uh, Morita's inauguration as Chief Executive blurred into years, some found that the rising tide had not left all boats for the former rivals. Uh, Justice suppliers were the ordinary men and women simply unlucky enough to fall outside of the government's programs. They saw the rise of Sony Chung Kong. Their star eclipsing all else and saw themselves falling further into the shadows. Uh, oh, look at that. But slowly, over the course of interminable seasons, the slighted and ignored found each other, and scattered apartments and repurposed conference rooms. A businessman showed out of the government contracts, a bureaucrat didn't add a promotion, a factory worker ineligible for assistance. Those who uh, Sony and Chong Kong had been forgotten by ignorance or by design found that they were not alone in their disappointment with broken promises. They looked out for each other where nobody else would. An interview for those recently unemployed, referrals of trusted suppliers for those facing a profit squeeze, a shelter for those facing eviction. Just as Marita and Lee had done, one dunce, done once, a fledging ecosystem of Zhujian blossomed to the shadow of the New Times of Industry, selling themselves to the world as the Guangdong Federation tradesmen in pride and defiance. Uh-oh. So in Chung Kong had paid them a little heed. Why should they? They had more pressing business to attend to. Every system has its cracks, and then we take action. As, uh, nice. The health commissioner did not have many chances to enter Marita's office, but that once rare happening was becoming much more frequent, a good sign in a certain way. He had been briefed on the matters at hand by Secretary Lee, and had taken such a keen interest in the endeavor that day and night, the light in his office would not dim. As he made his way through the secretary's room and into the main office, the shoes recently polished and navy blue pine strip suit, leather briefcase in hand, he thought about the pile of paperwork he had produced a massive folder of uh, statistical analyses, case studies, of frequency maps. As the door began to open, a thin ray of pale afternoon sunshine struck his tired eyes, greeted by Lee and Marita jointly. He placed his briefcase on the solid wood mahogany table and took out three copies of the report. As an attendant set up the pr uh, slide projector, the commissioner briefly exchanged pleasantries with Lee. Gentlemen, I see the commissioner has produced a great inquiry upon the current situation. Now, if you will, let us delve into the details. Look at the paper on the table. Commissioner reports. Oh, boy. God, we need more political power, don't we? Desperate measures, too. <laughs> At once, Mr. Chief Executive, uh, as you can see on the third page, a Table 1 for the most injuries happening in the very center of Guangdong, where the density is at its highest the incident of environment-related illnesses is also the highest in urban and industrial set clusters. I therefore suggest the creation of a qu quadrille system, one hospital in Canton, one in Hong Kong, and one in Macau. The first ought to make treat the more serious cases from the northern districts, well, smaller local clinics can handle the less serious injuries, same in Hong Kong, Serving as previously described, the Eastern District and in Macau, serving the Southwestern District. Of course, interconnectivity between the three major hospitals ought to be ensured, seeing the connectivity with the peripheral districts. Therefore, a large fleet of motor vehicles, helicopters, and small vessels will be required. Furthermore, each major hospital covering each assigned region should be able to operate independently, of course, overseen by a central entity. This is all well and good, Commissioner, but what about the costs? Such a major development scheme will come up with a pretty penny, Marita said. We do estimate a great, a deal, great deal of funds will be required in establishing and upkeeping the scheme. We will foresee our requirement of six general care beds per thousand people and two and a half of specialist care. The cost will be north of five billion USD. We realize this plan will be a, mo mon moment oh, be a momentary burden for the nation, but I'm sure the chief executive will see the merits of such a necessary and worthwhile scheme. We sure do. What will the others? We can make them, interjected Lee, which have been keenly listening. I say, Commissioner, that we must show Ibuka and the rest of the merits of our plan, a conference which would, would be in order. Don't you think, Marita? I concur, but I hope I will have the Secretary send out the invitation for the next month. But then I hope you can produce a summary of foreseen expenses to hand out. Of course, Mr. Chief Executive, I'll begin at once. With these words, he took leave, a wise smile, uh, the coronation of all that effort dedicated to such a noble cause, for a fundamental change. A frank conversation. Um, did I read this one? Yeah. <coughs> Shimoda Takeo was angry by the bonus he had received. The senior bureaucrat conferred with each of his colleagues and found that his nominal superior, the man he knew as Ri Kassel, or Kasai, was one responsible for that peer's bonuses. So he went to the man's office and coached him to complain for some reason. Ri, actually Li Kuxing, had been expecting him. Li courteously ushered him into a chair and asked what he wanted to discuss. 
uh, Shimoda took out uh, the opportunity to make his complaint. Mr. Riyams here, I beg your pardon, request a reconsideration of my bonus. It's far lower than I deserve given my long and diligent service to the city of Guangdong. Moreover, it's also far too small compared to both what I used to receive in previous years and what people around me, especially the Chinese Zhujin, are receiving. I worry, sir, that ethnicity might be playing a role in how you consider these things. Uh, Lee smirked. Shimoda turned paler as warm words came out of his boss's mouth. Your complaint is noted, but I'm aware of another important fact. That expensive vacation you took to Kyoto, Nara, the Jingu at Ise, home to the cost, and all those souvenirs and lucky artifacts you brought back from the Jingu and about 15 other temples uh, to give to people, how much did they go for? I'm told you had the senior priest bless them, and even a Chinese like me knows that ain't cheap. By now, Shimoda was pale as the papers worked on, but Lee raised a hand. Extravagance isn't a crime, and you won't be fired for this. But if you want that kind of extravagance, you best earn it fair and square. If somebody else wants to pay you, Mr. Shimoda, you're free to work for them uh, officially. But the government's only interested in the roaring, loyal, competent employees, and you better think about that. If Shimoda realized that Lee had a point, and he nodded directly, I, I will. Bribe Rome, let's see. So where are we at? 47. That's not bad. We're going to keep doing this as much as we have to. We're going to lose all that, a little bit more political power here soon, too. God dang it. Third revolution in Ecuador, huh? Yes, we've had one or two revolutions. How about another one? Field report, CS1. Oh, there goes Cameroon. The following reports a lo uh, log of all incidents involving the experimental equipment that was designed for a field team. Uh, 14 slash 3, 0900. CA1 fires and begins a fire support mission. Firing on grid K6, 21 rounds are fired across 15 minutes before the autoloader jams. CA1 then spends an hour attempting to fix the autoloader before realizing that they are missing critical parts that are necessary to complete the repair. CA1 returns to base. 15 slash 3, 1400. CA1 completes repairs at FOB. Uh, a second SPG is added to CA1 to increase combat effectiveness. Designated CA2. Team is able to make its way across the mountainous terrain in grid D2 before stopping in grid D4. However, 10 minutes in, CA1 uh, notices a drop in round velocity with observers reporting that rounds are falling short into grid K3, killing 11 friendlies. CA1 breaks off back to base while CA2 continues firing for another 30 minutes. Upon return to base, CA1 notices the proactive coating on the barrels of the gun are melting and installs a new barrel. Uh, 17 slash 3, 0800. CA2 is sent to grid E1, but is spotted by enemy air reconnaissance while en route. A helicopter unit, luckily blown into blank, attacks CA2 with a small arms fire, although the helicopter unit misses all anti vehicle munitions. A rifle fire is enough to penetrate the platform, and a bullet likely reaches either the ammunition belt or the gas tank, and CA2 is lost. IJ unit blank is tasked with ensuring that the enemy does not recover the wreck. Final recommendation Improve air armor rating. Replace barrel coating. Ensure all crews have necessary parts to maintain repairs. Rate of fires well above current IJ SPG, so design can be salvaged if survivability and reliability can be improved. Wow. No strength, huh? Doesn't matter. What matters is that we learn. Point two seven, huh? We literally just killed off one of our own units. Hey, you know what? that saves a little bit of money. That saves a little bit of money, not gonna lie. Because, my God, do we not have enough money? Do we have any more political power yet? God dang it. Thank you. Hey, so we got river crossings. We need mountain. And he's equipment. So, jungle. Oh, we do need jungle. Exceeding 25 degrees. Jungle, mountain, rainy or stormy. Well, it's rainy or stormy right now. Oh, just reward. Ah, uh, Lam Hao Sun eyed the desk of the two of his colleagues with some suspicion. The two men, who had been notorious in the department for the corruption, had been themselves in the possessions cleared out of the building over the weekend with no notice whatsoever. No trace of their existence remained, even their nameplates had been ground to pieces and thrown in the garbage. The Norwegian government's new corruption campaign seemed to be proceeding apace, and Lam worried about the amount of work he'd been forced to take on as a corrupt good-for-nothings who were supposed to get it got cleared out. As he thought about how to cope with a new possibility rush of work, his new subordinate, Chan Ka Kui, came back and saluted him. Ah, Tsun, our boss just said I'm getting a raise. Apparently, the higher ups are impressed by the work I put in on that one Kowloon robbery case. He told me to come and get you too. It seems that you'll get a raise too. As I'm not and got up to follow up by Chan, he looked back at the empty desk next to him and realized that Miss Yasukawa was probably right. Those idiot's wages were probably being diverted to his wallet. Not that he minded, though. Better with him than with them, he thought. So there's no thing that here that stops me us. MTI projects. Directly connects the public transportation networks of the three cities of the Pearl, uh, Pearl River. Outer Express. Monitors railways connecting the Pearl River and outer regions. Honestly, I can't support anything else. So, we'll see. We need the public works ordinance passed. The amended labor standards ordinance. So to declare our commitment to improving workers' rights is one thing, but to follow through to completion is quite another. We can only take ad hoc executive action via the understaffed and overworked labor bureau for so long. 
Uh, for our reforms to have any chance of being carried out in a comprehensive manner, we must win the approval of the Legislative Council. The proposed measures are nowhere near enough to be ideal for workers, but especially it's a good step for forward. Such is the reality of politics in Guangdong, where we cannot let the perfect become the enemy of the good. I think it's literally the only focus we can take right now. We've done everything else but that one. And we still don't have enough seats, god dang it. We need two more seats. What if we just don't do it? You know? And we can do desperate measures. Maybe we get another seat here. Maybe. I don't know. Um, I don't want to take... I mean, it is a 30-day focus. Don't get me wrong. And we could get a Matsushita seat, maybe. And that would take us to 49%, but it would increase corruption, so we lose even more political power now. 1.79, which is not that much more, in all honesty. Mountain, jungle. Are these all just mountains? Yeah, they are. So you just get over here. I want you to fight in the... Uh, so that kind of sucks. I hope we can do this. I really hope we can do this. We should be able to. By the skin of our teeth, we be, will be barely able to do any and all of this. Get over here. There you go. Nice. That just saves a few bucks, right? Not much. We got a lot of army XP. Look at that. Nice. Too bad we can't edit our divisions. Mountainous combat operations. Is it, is it raining anywhere? No. Bogata is actually an urban area, so we don't need to fight there. Uh, this is uh, a valley, so we don't need to fight there. So if anything, if they're attacking us, you just kind of hold out. Oh, there's a jungle down here, but there's no one here. Bruh. Come on, man. Are you learning here? Part 1946, part 2. Lunch break. A quarter pack of cigarettes spent watching the ships in Port Shorty sail away into the distance, their hulls disappearing before their sterns. It was a sunny day. It had been four months since Lamb left the village, yet to the reporter, the bustle of Hong Kong was still a sight. The hot, landward wind brushed past his hair as he watched the city go beneath the parapet of the hotel's roof. He heard something scrape the concrete beside him and saw Ah Tan behind him. Shifts back on, Autan said, the face deadpan before breaking into a smile. Just kidding. Still half an hour yet, me slinked his Lamb leaning on the parapet. So getting used to the city? Yeah, Lamb set out a furtive uh, cigarette. He got all the pack to tan and took one. Lamb lit both cigarettes as he watched the white smoke congeal with the atmosphere of the city. Heard any news from your folks back home? Got word from my girlfriend, Tan said, grinning slightly. She's getting by. Her father's doing backbreaking work down at the farms. And mother, well, his smile faded into a cold frown. Mother's mother. Why'd you come over here anyway? Lamb took a long drag off a cigarette. Seems like you got a lot going on. Tan smiled wryly. That's between me and myself. Fair. And you? Lamb. Gave the question some thought. Been asking myself the same thing. He looked down at the river streets below. That's pedestrians walking down the avenue like little ants, plying from one end of the city to the other. Make a little name out here and all, I suppose. He put the butt of a cigarette beneath the heel of his shoe and ground it out. Flickers of embers escaped. Half an hour out, yeah, he said, pulling out another cigarette from the pack. The beginning of greatness? A month had passed since the commissioner had been in Marita's office. Now, just like last, a chill of fear began running down his spine. For now, things were much different. The stakes much higher. They could not have been able to make a convincing argument. That whole plan could have gone down the drain. And that was not something he was ready to accept. All the toiling he had put in producing that document, every word of which had been wisely chosen, and every statistic carefully gathered and backed up. That day, he gave a passionate speech that it seemed like to five tycoons that his life depended on it, and to some extent it might have. After wrapping a speech in a slide, one could tell each of the tycoon's impressions by the looks on their faces. Masashiro was first to speak. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner, he began, for his most excellent study of the current situation. I concur with many of your points, but both moral and material, but the issue I must raise is that of economic viability. Such a major expense cannot be borne by the state alone, nor can the funds come from our coffers either. Therefore, let me propose a combined scheme, for which half of the cost will be paid for by the Treasury, and the other half be paid in kind with labor and equipment from the various companies. The system will be beneficial for all. What seems to elude you, Master Shida, is that our mandate is based on decoupling the companies from the bureaucracy. As much as you might not like it, that is the current state of affairs. With these harsh words, Lee swiftly brought the chances of getting Master Shida to collaborate to zero. Good. Anyone else? Five cacophonies. No, City Booker raising the tone. My colleague, Matsushita, raises a valid point. If we have no way to benefit materially from this endeavor, why should we invest in the first place? I say we develop a scheme in which something of value can be provided to us, for example, exclusive rights to provide for the expertise in real estate for the entirety of the contract's duration. You do realize that. <clears throat> Uh, Marita certainly addressed his nemesis uh, for the people to have access to those financial and fiscal liberties we hold near and dear to our hearts. They need to have equal access to what we might deem the most important contributor to growth and success, namely good health and education. And in addition, don't you think that it would be more of a worthwhile endeavor to grant the ability to succeed independently of their affiliation? Marita's words were more motivated by hatred than reason, and Ibuka recognized this for his former partner was unusually ideo ideological. Uh, ideologic, rather than his usual pragmatic style. Komai sat on the other side of the table, was keeping to his usual quiet. Suddenly, after a sip from his teacup, his slips began moving. I see the tone of this discussion has moved on from calm and rational to pa passionate and idealistic. 
I am of the opinion that this is not beneficial to finding a solution, therefore I am expressing our position very clearly at first. The idea of a general improvement and workers' conditions was found to be agreeable, but after seeing the burden of some of the responsibilities to be taken up by the private enterprise, we of that attachment group cannot express a commitment to what would betray a betrayal of the fundamental principles that led to the establishment of this very place, those being fiscal ease and freedom from regulation. If we were to smash those tenants, this whole operation would collapse on itself. We owe nothing to the worker but what we do by law. No one uttered a word after Kumai finished speaking. Muruti gave him a blank stare. Lee, disgusted by his statement, refused to even look at him. Matsushita, discouraged by the totality of his rejection, felt a sense of fear. Ibuka, probably closest to Kumai's stance, was already planning the next moves. Muruti, now fueled by the other Rude Tycoon's unwillingness to cooperate, was more than before sure that this measure must be pushed through. It was right, moral thing to do. Paradox 5, and one crisis ends. And another one begins, probably. God, this is... Oh. Maruti Kiao stared at the newspaper. The moment he entered his office in the morning, the secretary handed a paper to him and told him to look over in his office. Good news, she called him. When she, he settled into the office and looked it over, he saw the words he had been waiting for. Long Yun killed in action, and the last remnants of the war, Western insurrection had been taken out by the Chinese soldiers. One nightmare, at least, was over. The chief executive sighed. There would be more to say, of course, and more to do. Chan, in this current state, could never promise the kind of complete stability that the emperor had always asked of it. Even its loyalty might someday come into question, but... These would be internal problems. As a rule, they were not the things which would harm Guangdong the most. Murti Kiao turned his back to his work. For now, the time had come to focus inward once more. Guangdong had more already enough enemies. Still has enough enemies. And Japan's still trying their best, but, you know, it is what it is. Is it hot? It's very hot. We attack here? Can you get experience? I don't know if it's hot enough. Oh, it's fighting in jungle conditions. Well, there's no storm here. Oh, well, there's kind of a storm here, yeah. There's a storm here, too. PTRG mission tracker. Hey, look at that. Oh, we got the storm done. So we need mountain and jungle. Screw everything else. Where are you at, son? Oh, can we do it? Oh, man. 43%. Oh! Oh, 43%. Do we have 50? Oh, we have 50 votes. Oh, I love bribing people. God, I wish I had more money in my real life. Anyways, um, so with this, holy crap, there's a lot of things going on here. So we get trinket subsidies, going to cost us more. Poverty gets better, increases Chinese government support, increases China's opinion, increases Chung Kong seats, new safety regulations, more than moderate regulations. Um, we get more Zhuzhin support, increases Sony seats, poverty begins to rapidly improve like crazy, increases uh, Chinese and Zhuzhin support due to building codes, poverty get better, increases Japanese, uh, Zhuzhin and Chinese support. And we have worker safety stuff here, too. We did it. Oh, boy. God, I hate corruption. Go and spend your stuff there. Oh, my God. And the quagmires are tomorrow. What good is a man who believes in is truly only that which his eyes can see? Task him with a compromised apartment. I'm sure he'll doubtlessly list the broken stairways, the faulty fire alarms, the crumpled wallpaper. Ask him why simple-minded clerk's numbers don't add up, and they'll be quick to point out their mistaken sums. They're sloppy assumptions. But what are the marshy ground holding aloft ten stories of rusted bar and crack lips and concrete? Or the clerk were no clerk, but a child who never learned to sum, students who never learned accounting because their schools never bothered. And the complex collapses like pancakes, the universities report their own dismal numbers. When the inquiries are shouted and the fingers pointed, who else is it to blame but the man with more sight than foresight? Companies are no less immune to such failing men than men. Many expected it from them, even. that do, Many may apply to our peers, but not to Sony, nor to Chong Kong. We've come too far to, too far to repeat their mistakes. If Guangdong expects foresight from the government, then foresight we good businessmen show for in generous rates. A better life, a better world? Marita did not want to talk with Matsushita. After that fiasco of a conference, his mind was set on pushing through the state-funded healthcare, but he recognized how hard it could be to pass such a radical measure through the council. He thought even for a brief moment that half the corporate, half state-funded system would still be a great leap forward compared to the current situation. He picked up the phone, dialed for a secretary, and asked her to get Matsushita on the line. As soon as the phone rang, he lazily, with one all-encompassing movement of the body, picked up the handset. Matsushita was, of course, speaking. Hello, Masaharu. I've uh, had you call because I want to discuss what you proposed last week at the conference. I must admit, your offer is not the most enticing offer, but after careful evaluation, I've chosen to take what's good and what I hold to be the only viable option to have any impact on the current state of affairs. Uh, most excellent. I knew you were a man of reason. Now, if you will, we ought to discuss the fine points and details of the plan. We shall. Let's get over with this, shall we? Mm. <sighs> the two spent hours discussing in depth every point of plausible agreement, firmly but cordially expressing their dissent every now and then. Uh, Night had fallen in the office, leaving only the chief executive and a few secretaries. Starting to get tired, Maruta moved, on, moved to end the call. Thank you for your time. I'll come back with you once I hear those proposals. I'm sorry, but lives are sticky. Your offer's not worthwhile. At this point, what is corruption? Um, well, we could get... Mountain's pretty done e easily, pretty because we'll have to fight up here a lot. Let's come down here, actually. 
and do this maybe instead. Just because it'll give us more stuff to do here. Okay. Can't believe we actually passed it. A lot of corruption now, but you know, it is what it is. 60% growth is not bad. Can you, like, get down here? Oh! They actually did really well there. Are you still fighting here too? Yeah. There still be mounds on. Why not? Oh, we gotta fight the Americans. Oh god, no. Oh god, we're still not done with this. No, I mean, it'll be done soon. 47, that's not bad. That's actually really good. Investing in human capital. And. Okay, Uruguay has been doing okay. Success of the amendment. Today, the four controlling powers of the Legislative Council, Ibuka, Matsushita, Morita, and Komai, joined as they often were by Li Kishin of Chong Kong, debated the proposal of amending the Labor Standards Ordinance to include more stringent protections for workers. <coughs> uh, the debate uh, began hard and fast with Li defending the proposal on its merits. Protecting worker welfare would, after all, ensure less worker mortality and injuries, thereby increasing profits. It was countered by a disdainful Ibuka, who argued that there was absolutely no need to worry about worker welfare as a means to increase profits when other, more efficient methods could be pursued. Matsushita, on the other hand, simply argued that all of them were only in this to make a profit as businessmen, and any method ought to be afforded fair consideration. Morita argued that Suzuki Taichi had it completely right when he argued that the long-term interests of Guangdong demanded some kind of protections and guarantees for workers, thus Guangdong ran out of workers before it ran out of money. At that point, Komai utterly lost the debate for this. No side by scoffing and saying that people could be imported just like anything else. While the other four speakers had gotten some kind of applause for their arguments, Komai got only a zen-like stance having put his foot in his mouth and tried to eat it. As a result, the vote swung in Murray's favor. Minus 0.25. Wow! Cost. And we still have a surplus. Hey, not bad. Oh, God. Yeah, so we're, we're struggling here. But now with that done, do we have other options we can do? Yes! It opened up other things here. 44 seats. 44... 36. Oh, God. Uh, oh. Public work ordinance. Interesting. Um, you might be able to do this. Adds... So, we might come down here next. We'll save this one for last. Can we do anything up here? Yes, we can. Entertainment boom. Guangdong Entertainment, once lagging behind China and Europe, is experiencing truly explosive growth. While tens of millions of radios connecting families and millions of TV viewers added in recent years, demand for the entertainment industry is growing rapidly. From news programs to TV and radio dreams, dramas to movies, the people of Guangdong seem to want to want food to fill their bored hearts beyond filling their stomachs. I'll probably do the housing crisis next, maybe. I'm going to do all this stuff next. Um, increases Chong Kong seats. The housing crisis increases Chong Kong seats. Yeah, the housing crisis. Straight away from Chan Wai's lamp lights at night, and you'll find yourself a tourist of the Guangdong undergrowth, hidden beneath its neon billboards and glitzy high rises. Here, the poor and desperate huddle in ramshackle rooms, the sides of cabinets clustered to one another like aggregate tumors. Not because they can't, because they can't anywhere else. What well, trickles down from corporate offices to a shorter wide street is paper trash rather than paper money. Nobody spares any hope for the island's 100,000 souls. No, they scrape their hope find hope themselves from wherever they can find it. Whorehouses, opium dens, pachinko machines. Skim flints would balk at the upfront cost of bringing hope to settlements like Chai Wan. Chief Secretary Lee sees no costs. Only the young ones playing marbles and hopscotch. Faces besmirched with dirt yet pearl scent. As their parents look on and wonder if their paper-thin walls will suffice against a frigid winter chill. It was one of them once. So, we're going to end it there. We were very successful in this episode and we're doing really well now, finally. You know, for the most part. Um, if you enjoyed the video, please consider leaving a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below if you haven't already. And I'll see you tomorrow as we continue making Guangdong somewhat hospitable for the natives in Zhujian. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.